you, and I know some of you will, will you know, know all about this, but there's others who might not. But I want to, uh, I want to talk about time, place, manner restrictions. Professor uh, Varelli, um, last fall when the Occupy movement was heating up, many folks contacted us and talked, spoke to each other and said, wait a second, how can the government pass laws, how can TPD come out and limit our free speech and limit our free expression when all we want to do is hang out at Curtis Hickson Park and take over the park for you know forever you know for for how long that's just free expression and the question arose over and over and they wanted us to come to their aid in terms of you know making sure the city would let them sleep in the parks which is a, you know p potentially a first amendment type of thing but other types of free expression and free speech issues were were at risk at the time can you ex explain to all of us how the government can regulate speech and specifically explain the government's ability to enforce reasonable time place manner restrictions kind of con law 101 uh, maybe con law one i'll leave out the o one I, mean, uh, I think it's a relatively simple concept that many of you will know as well as i um, it's a it's a balancing act in general um, most of the most of all of the rights in the bill of rights end up creating some sort of a balancing act. there are no absolutes in any of those first ten amendments there are no absolutes in the 14th. There are no abs I guess the 13th is the closest, but that's for a different panel. Um, the First Amendment protects our right to speech and, and uh, protects our right to express ourselves. It does not protect that right absolutely independent of other responsibilities or independent of the government's responsibility to keep citizens safe, to protect the health and welfare of the public. And the time, place, and manner restrictions, and that's become a term of art, but that's really what they are. Time, place, and manner restrictions are a way that the Supreme Court has recognized to balance the interest in the public of the public in free speech and expression and the needs of the government again remember free the free our free speech rights are exercised only against the government so we have no constitutional free speech rights against private actors so it really is a balance between individuals rights to speak and the government's ability or need to restrict that speech in reasonable ways as i tell my students con law is about tests as much as it is about answers and what is the test for a time place and manner restriction the government is allowed to create reasonable restrictions that are narrowly tailored to a significant government interest that leave open ample alternative channels for speech. That is a lot of language. We will talk about it, I'm sure, and, and deconstruct it over the time we're here. But that is the idea. Reasonable regulations, narrowly tailored or directed at or rela closely related to an important government interest like health and safety that leave open alternative channels that are not prohibitive of the ultimate right to express one's views in some sort of public way. And I hope that's a good start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, City Attorney uh, Schimberg, we, this past week, uh, all the newspapers and, and the other media sources have been uh, reporting about the so-called clean ordinance, clean zone ordinance, that uh, the city administration, the mayor, and your office have been working on. Um, and it's 18 pages long. Uh, everybody can look it up online. Uh, because it's coming to City Council for their, uh, this Thursday morning's uh, agenda for first reading. Um, Jim, I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain a little bit um, you know, why the city administration and your office feel that it's important to have a clean zone ordinance. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and clearly there, there are restrictions and limitations on free speech. Speak to perhaps the reasonableness of it, as as Professor uh, Varelli uh, spoke to a minute ago, and uh, you and I have had many of these conversations over the last couple of months, um, just generically about about these types of issues. So, um, and and then after you get done speaking about it uh, generally, I want you to speak to the 60-minute limitation provision, if you can. Okay. Probably want to pull that mic. Well, we've, we've been working for, for quite some time on what the appropriate type of ordinance that we should present to City Council for their consideration. And I know we've got... We can't hear you. We're talking away from the We've been working on an ordinance to present to City Council for their consideration, and then we'll start that consideration this week. And there, as we mentioned, there are several members here today, and I'm not in any way intending to speak for them. Of course, please. But yeah, there's a draft. Um, we've looked at other jurisdictions that have hosted national conventions. We've talked to attorneys, um, we've talked to law enforcement. We've been, as you mentioned, there's been a very close group that's been working together. Everybody from the 
Secret Service to the local law enforcement to transportation, um, different different parts of the city administration, and we're trying to put together uh, an ordinance that would respect First Amendment rights as well as what we consider give us you know the best ability to have a safe and productive convention. So the draft ordinance has things like permitting expedited permitting processes because you've been beating us up for a long time that our current permitting processes take too long. We've got that, that's the good part of the ordinance. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We've got uh, you know, expedited permitting processes. We've extended hours of operation for our city parks. We have um, we're going to create an official parade route for, for groups that want to, to you know, conduct a parade during that time frame of the convention. We've also created what we call the clean zone, which was patterned after what we've done in Super Bowls. As you know, campus hosted several Super Bowls, and they call it the clean zone. I think that's why we call this ordinance that. But it identifies certain parts of, of the city that you know, certain items that could be used as weapons or could be used for uh, purposes that, that may not be peaceful. Um, would be prohibited or, or restricted. Okay. Um, thank you, Jim. Mickey, um, you and I have been around the block, uh, as indicated by our white hair, but... Uh, 60 minutes. Uh, the 60 minutes, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, Mickey, what, how do you feel about... Have you had a chance to read some of this ordinance uh, over the last day or so? I, I, you know, how do you feel about this? Um, you know, they call, it, they call one area the public viewing area, and other cities they've called it the free speech zone. Um, does that jump out at you as problematic at all? Well, you know, uh, going back to the time, place, and manner restrictions, the key word in that phrase is reasonable. And uh, what somebody thinks from the government is reasonable may differ greatly from what the press or the public thinks is reasonable. Um, the question is, and I know I'm kind of mixing metaphors here, but, but um, you know, in another very important case, separate uh, was not necessarily equal. So when you've got people that are allowed to speak what they feel like saying or allowing the press to cover that, but they're so far away from being effective to actually give voice uh, to, to those people, I, I think that, that that in itself could be a problem. Um, almost all of these things are very fact specific. Uh, I'm sure, uh, no matter how well things go, that there are going to be cases that are going to be argued when people are arrested. And I'm sure each and every one of them will hinge on the specific facts of what happened and what was going on during that time, which is one of the reasons I believe it's so important to be able to document uh, and record those events. Because when you get down to the he said, she said, um, usually, and I see, I see a lot of this, um, the criminal complaint or the police report sometimes differs very greatly from the video and the audio of that very same scene. So keeping the press away sometimes serves a purpose. Um, Mickey, just as a, as a follow-up, the you know, one of the things that I sent you an email about today, because we just noticed it, is that uh, one of the three things that are prohibited in the public viewing area, um, in, and maybe even the entire clean zone, include monopods, bipods, and tripods. And I asked uh, uh, the city about that, and they said, well, TPD has concern that these metal poles could be used, or have been used elsewhere as weapons. I would think that your organization could have a lot of concern about that, especially you know, with your folks who have big cameras and don't want to be lugging around in the August heat. Well, that, that's true, but uh, I, I'm sure in that kind of fluid situation, and I shot long enough, it's, it's really nice to have the luxury of being able to shoot on sticks, uh, as these guys in the back can attest to. But when you've got the police moving around and protesters moving around, I think it's going to be very unlikely that most people are going to be using a tripod. Uh, you know, I've shot. Uh, the sidelines at e for ESPN for 12 years. Nobody gets to have a tripod on the sideline. It's dangerous when the players might run into that. But that being said, I also don't know of any photographer that would think of using a tripod or their camera as, as a weapon, uh, of, I mean, a weapon of hitting somebody. It's, it's a very powerful weapon as, as in, you know, the pen, just reminding you of that sword. 
but not to be used as, as to assault somebody. Okay, uh, Jim, I didn't mean to let you off the hook. Um, on the si on the sixty minute the sixty minute limitation, and that's been written about in the in the newspapers. Um, basically, uh, what that says is that that if you're going to hold a protest rally or an assembly, or if you're going to hold a parade and you go through the permit process, that somehow or another the city wants each of the groups to limit themselves to 60 minutes. Well, what's the purpose of that? And, and uh, Julie, Ellen, what do you, how do you feel about that? First, let me, you know, caveat again that this is an ordinance that's being presented. Talk to us. Sorry, talk to us. Keep it, keep it close to the mouth. <laughs> The, you know, the draft ordinance has that in there. That's obviously up for city council consideration. The purpose of that was twofold. One was that some of the police officers during that time frame were going to be wearing heavy equipment and would not be able to stand out in the August heat for very long. The second issue is I don't know how many of you went to the mayor's um, state of the city address this morning, but it was early April. And it was in the boiling hot sun, and you know, luckily it didn't last an hour. But I don't know how you'd be able to go much longer. We also want to try to create as many spots as possible for groups to be able to participate, either in the parades or in the, you know, the public gathering. So that was based on the evidence that we determined. That was what we thought was the appropriate time limit. Obviously, that's up for city council consideration. Julie Ellen. Well, I mean, I think that it gets back to that reasonableness, a subjective term that um, I think when you do are dealing with such a short amount of time and, you know, ideally there are going to be a lot of people out there um, probably interested in having praise. I think, you know, it depends. It's kind of balancing, accommodating all of those who do want to have the praise with the uh, amount of space available and I think that that's the second part you know the amount of space available you know making sure that there are ample opportunities um, both within the clean zone and outside the clean zone where people you know can ass assemble and have parade routes but um, I think that 60 minutes is uh, you know the reasonableness you know as we were talking about earlier it can really mean a lot of different things you know the city might think it's reasonable but do the, the groups outside groups think it's reasonable and what is, you know, if it, no matter how much time, um, what, who would be happy um, with the set amount of time for a parade? Well, yeah, and, and, you know, some people might come with a group of 100 and you, and you might be able to march 100 through your parade route within an hour. But another group called me today and they, I said, how many do you think about bringing? And they said, easily, 1,000. So to get 1,000 people organized and that type of thing and then marching, you know, and going where they need to go, et cetera, and have all that done in 60 minutes could be a real challenge. Even if they're peaceful, you know, then all of a sudden TPD it, it, it is going to say time's up, and what if they're only halfway done with the route? And, and these are some really practical issues that I hope uh, City Council uh, and the city continues to address. Um, let's move on. The, um, there's another provision in the ordinance um, having to do with the prohibition of masks. And, and it's kind of interesting because, um, as, as we all know, the use of masks, uh, I think, came into vogue in the 60s and 70s. You always saw the Richard Nixon mask. Um, I, think, I think in Tampa we'll be seeing the, the Romney or the Santorum or maybe even the Bob Buckhorn mask might reappear. Um, but anyway, the, the, the ordinance uh, uh, prohibits masks in, throughout the clean zone. And the clean zone has been defined not only as I expected the clean zone to be, you know, downtown Tampa, but the clean zone as it's defined in this in this particular draft not only includes downtown Tampa, but includes Ybor City and Channel Side, which is sort of an extension of downtown. But then it jumps into some severely residential, purely residential areas, including Davis Island, Hyde Park. Uh, I think it's got you, Rob. Um, uh, Davis Island Hyde Park, Tampa Heights, and up the river in the Riverside uh, area. Purely residential areas that just happen to be butt butted up against downtown. So, so the scenario um, that I thought about trying to be, since we're in a law school professor, 
uh, I tried to come up with this law school exam type thing. So, so what I was thinking about was, okay, you got a group of four protesters, and they're totally worn out, and they decide to take a lunch break. So they go up the river to Ricks on the River. Everybody know Ricks on the River? It's about a mile, it's about a mile north of here, right up the river, and it is in the clean zone, because it's just south of Columbus Boulevard. They bring their Bob Buckhorn masks, and they put them on at lunch while they're discussing, you know, their next, uh, uh, you know, the next activity at the convention. Under Section 8 of the current draft ordinance, they will, they are clearly in violation of that provision by wearing the masks in the in the clean zone, anywhere in the clean zone, even if it's a mile up the river. They could get arrested for violating that city code, potentially convicted of a second degree misdemeanor, and serve in jail for 60 days. Professor uh, Varelli, as a con law professor, how does that regulation sit with you? Uh, is it reasonable, time, place, and manner restrictions? And you are sitting next to the city attorney. No. And, <laughs> and the student who I know, who now I know what she feels like when she's in my class. Thank you very much for the hypo. Um, I think the concerns are the same that they always are. There is First Amendment precedent that says anonymity is a protected right, and an anonymous speech is a protected right, the wearing of masks is a protected right. That doesn't change the existence of the time, place, and manner requirement. Um, I think questions of reasonableness, the context, the facts are going to make all of the difference there. Um, is there an alternative avenue for that speech? Is there a significant government interest to play in prohibiting masks in that way, in that time? I think you're going to see conversations about that. Um, and as I said, uh, let me remind you, con law is generally not about answers all the time. Um, it is, Mickey is absolutely right, and I'm not surprised that I'll probably say that lots of times today. Um, that it is very much contextual and it's very much a matter of the audience and the environment in which you are expressing your views. I will say, and I'm, I am causing trouble because I think that's my license as an academic, but what I thought of when I read this was a burqa. Was a what? A burqa. <laughs> now I really caused trouble and I apologize to the city council people in the room. But I, I think those are the sorts of First Amendment issues that are invited by all of these questions. And time, place, and manner is primarily a speech issue, not a free exercise issue. And so I think there are things at play here that it, and I will say, it is impossible, in my view, for any legislature to anticipate in its entirety, and certainly for a drafter to anticipate. So I am not intending to besmirch, I promise, sir, the efforts made. Um, but I think these issues are inevitable. They always crop up at this point, and I have the unique position of being able to identify them and not have to solve them, so I will stop. <laughs> And just in case y'all want to know why I'm staying so quietly uh, here is because you have to be arrested first for my office to become involved and it's at that point that we would then address the constitutionality of the underlying ordinance that exists and so uh, I that's why I said seven to ten days I anticipate my job will not stop and as a matter of fact I have a colleague here from uh, Bartow uh, the Tenth Circuit who does our appellate work and that goes to show you when we talk about partnerships we are anticipating that perhaps the constitutionality of the ordinance may come into play very quickly as soon as the very first arrest is made. We have to have some emergency procedures in place. That's what partnering is about. Uh, I think the city understands what my role is. I know the community understands it and I assure you that, that we are anticipating uh, quick work probably on day one uh, and we stand ready to do so. And now